Welcome to Podcast Movement 2014. We're here to talk about the wild, wild west of podcasting. Our guest today is Evo Terror. Woo! Woo! Evo. Evo was one of the first top podcasters out there. Evo was back when there was no such thing as the iTunes. It was a U-Tunes. It was those two together, put together. Evo was so old that back then, <laughs> you had to create your own RSS feed. Woo, back then, you had no such thing as a VA. And the worst part of it, you had no affiliate links. <laughs> Evo came a long way. Now, Evo pioneered the days. Boy, I tell you what, he wrote a book. The first podcast for dummies book. And Evo was one of the first people, the first folks on XL Radio. Man, this man has been around the wild, wild west of podcasting. But ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm Texas round of applause for the wild, wild west man of podcasting, Mr. Evo Terry. Come on down, Evo. Hot dog. Hot dog. When the forest burns along the road. Oh, all right, so I got to live up to that. Awesome. All right. Um, everybody hear me okay? So let's talk about, uh, I, they, they finished this whole idea of this podcast movement conference, and they said, hey, you want to be a keynote speaker? Sure. You got to A, bat clean up, and B, follow Chris Brogan. So, okay. I'm going to give that a shot. Speaking of Brogan, um, the first two keynotes, if you were here for that this morning, they both brought up the topic uh, <clears throat> of masturbation in their show. So we're going to kick it up a notch and go with a live demonstration. So for those of you that are interested, <laughs> please raise your non-dominant hand. And uh, no, I'm kidding. Luckily, luckily for you, I'm kidding. We're not actually going to do that. Uh, what we're going to do instead is we're going to talk about this topic of podcasting 10 years, uh, a disruption 10 years in the making. But before I do that, Donald was kind enough to give you some of my CV. But as I look out in the audience, I'm a I'm a little bit embarrassed to say that I don't recognize all of you out there, which probably means a good number of you don't have any idea who the hell I am. So if you will indulge me a few moments, I would like to go through just some of my podcasting CV because some of the things I say towards the end might get a smidge on the controversial side, so I think I need all the credibility ahead of time that I can possibly muster. So as mentioned, um, my name is Evo Terra, and I've been podcasting for an incredibly long time, obviously. On October 14th, 2004, that was when I became a podcaster. Out of curiosity, has anybody out here been podcasting prior to that? Nope, me, I win. Awesome. <laughs> um, but before I was doing that, that's not my first four way into this. Uh, this show, The Dragon Page, I had done, my partner and I had been doing for two years as an internet radio program. We had already been syndicated across the country on a handful of radio stations. So I'd been doing this for a while. In fact, we even managed to talk our way, how I have no idea, into a live weekly show for a couple of hours on the number one talk radio station in the entire Southwest, uh, which was bizarre. But the good news is, my message to you is, I trust me when I say I know a little bit about audio, know a little bit about podcasting, and, and also broadcasting uh, as well. Beyond that, I did a show in, in March of 2005. We launched called Slice of Sci-Fi. Slice of Sci-Fi was yet another, I mean, obviously there's a science fiction shows, clearly you can get that by now. Um, Slice of Sci-Fi was the number one rated show in iTunes uh, for a part of 2005. We also won uh, the top rated podcast award from Podcast Awards which was a little redundant, Todd, but that's okay. Uh, it, was, it was a good time. And that show went on to be the XM Satellite Show. It had an eight-year run on XM Satellite Radio, most of which had nothing to do with me, but we, we started the program uh, originally. In the April, or two, 2005 was a pretty busy year for me. I launched a service called patiobooks.com, which is exactly what it sounds like. We combined podcasting and audiobooks. Podiobooks. More than one person's come up to me at this conference and didn't know how to pronounce that. It's a podcasting conference. Come on, patio books. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, this, we, just so you know, for, for stats-wise, because we're all stats junkies here, I just checked the numbers. Uh, we have 678 different 
audiobooks that are available as free podcasts, 678. And last month, uh, we generated, the, the number we generally generate, uh, about 1.5 million episodes were downloaded. So that's a lot of work that we do. And, I'm, and, I, still, and I still run the place. Um, and it's a fun time. Uh, somebody at one point in time in my life said I should have a cult, so I decided to pretend that I did have one, and I ran a perpetually pod-fading show called uh, Evo's Cult Cast, oddly enough. Uh, if, you, if you've heard that one, awesome. If you didn't, don't worry. They're all off the internet. Uh, I, I made sure that my reputation is safe, because that's probably for the best. As mentioned before, I did write Podcasting for Dummies. Um, it's been in three different editions now. That particular uh, book has my partners in, in writing. I didn't write the whole thing by myself. As I say, I wrote all the funny parts, um, the actual stuff I left to, to other sorts of people. Uh, did anybody by chance buy this book by show of hands or something? Sweet. I'm adding about, about $8.13 in royalties I made. Sweet. Sweet. Thank you very much. Good news is that is still, it's in three, third edition. It's still the number one best selling podcast, uh, how to podcast book, which is great. It also led me to write this book or co author this again, which came out a couple of years later um, Expert Podcasting Practices for Dummies, which is arguably the worst book title ever. <laughs> Expert book for dummies. Yeah. Anyhow, and, and if my royalty statements are any indication, none of you own that book. I'm relatively, <laughs> relatively certain that's the case. Um, back before we had a podcast movement conference, by the way, give it up, podcast movement, what a great show. We're having a good time, right? <laughs> Prior to that, and probably as an impetus from Gary Leland, since he was there all the time, we had these shows in Ontario, California called the Podcast Expo, the Podcast and New Media Expo, and the Portable Media Expo, and I'm not kidding, it changed names every single year for those of us who remember going to it. If you happen to attend, uh, I just pulled just one shot. The, I was the one responsible for the naked body painting at the Libsyn party, uh, as well as bringing the big DJ in that got the cops called. It was an awesome, awesome time. And I'd like to check your hands and see if any of them were still blue, because there were a few that did that. Um, I, I do a lot with podcasting, or I did a lot with podcasting conventions. There's a show in Balti Baltimore, Maryland called Balticon, oddly enough, that has a large new media track. Uh, I also have a penchant for getting people to get naked. Here's podcaster and musician George Traub, who took off all of his clothes, much to podcaster Mer Lafferty's delight. She really enjoyed that. Um, I then took a break. I, I, I left the, uh, the Farpoint Media Group. Those were where we did all the science fiction shows. Um, and I started up again after about a year. I had the itch to podcast that wouldn't go away, and so my wife and a good friend of ours who I taught how to do all of the work because I didn't want to, we started up a show called Evo at 11. Uh, that was a lot of fun. We ran it for exactly 100 episodes and then killed it. I didn't tell my wife or my partner. I just killed it on the, on the 100th show. So that pissed them off and a, and a couple hundred followers who seemed to enjoy it. <clears throat> I, give, I try to give back as much as I can to the podcasting community, which is why I, I, I came here to, to this particular show as well. Uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, where I live, I was for three years, thank you, shout out for Phoenix, uh, for the one other person from Phoenix here. <laughs> That's not true, there are two or three. Um, I was the co-organizer for PodCamp AZ. PodCamps, you guys all probably know about those. There were several of them. We ran it for a number of years in Phoenix. Uh, I not only organized it, but I also gave several talks and presentations. This one was the one that pissed off most of the people. Uh, and also is, I think, why BuzzFeed has the same articles writing that they always do, you know, five things why this is going to kill you. So I guess you can blame me, because that was back in 2008 when that started. Lest you think I'm only an audio guy, Started dabbling in video podcasting back in 2011 with the show called Isn't Rocket Surgery. A good friend of mine named Jeff and, and business partner, we started that. That led us to do this, which is called the Books and Beer Hangout. Ran that for about two years. Um, can you guess what it was about? Right. Pretty straightforward, um, us drinking beer uh, and talking uh, about books. And that was all done as a Google Plus Hangout, the one as a podcast, which was an interesting experiment. That ran for about two years. Um, I also wrote, let's see, speaking of beers and books, I, I wrote that. I'm talking about that later. It's nothing to do with the podcasting. But I did write a book about how you can lose weight on beer, which is an interesting topic, which we can talk about at some point in time. Um, 
the people that own blog, blog World who bought the rights to the Podcast Expo, New Media Expo, whatever else it's called, in 20, 2012, flew me out to New York City to talk on a panel specifically about the resurgence of podcasting. Um, you'll probably, if you can't tell right here, uh, Murrah and I are both really, really hungover because I took her out drinking the night before. It was a lot of fun. I promise I'm almost done with this up, th up front spiel. And then now, today, I run a company called Big Bounce. We help disruptive startups become real businesses. It has absolutely nothing to do with podcasting, but it does have everything to do with disruption, and that is the topic of the conversation today. So, in short, I'm old. I have been doing this for a long time. This is just a smattering of the podcasting things and disruptive things that I have been uh, involved with um, since almost the beginning, as, as we have indicated. But enough about me and history lessons. I really want to get into you and disruption and podcasting. So now, I have, just from the, this one day of being here, I, there are people who don't even have a podcast yet, and they're really, really old people. So if you will humor me for, for one more second, I want, I want to try something. You guys have been very reluctant to raise your hands and stuff. So I'm going to ask you to do that. If you have been podcasting, if, you, if you've not started podcasting, you've been doing podcasting for less than a year, hands up. If you have been at the two years you've been doing this, hands up. Oh, we're starting to go down. Three? Who's been doing it for longer than four years? Oh, so there was this nice little gap in the middle. That's kind of cool. Five years? Two, three, six? Seven? Eight? Nine, Clinton, Lynette, <laughs> ten. You guys both get, yeah, yeah. So, because we're here. In case you haven't done the math, it's been ten years that we've been doing this thing called podcasting. Ten years. Came out in the summer of June 2004. Ten years. Man, that is, that is really, really old. Look at this chart. Look at everything that is on that side of the chart. These are all things that are younger than podcasting, right? Twitter, younger than podcasting. When podcasting was invented, iTunes or Apple didn't make a phone. Google didn't make a mobile operating system. You never watched a video on YouTube because it didn't exist. And unless you were a student, you weren't on Facebook. Ten years. That is a crazy amount of time. But is it a disruption? The point of my talk today. To help us understand that, let's look at the technologies that I just talked about, because every single one of them is disruptive, and I'll, sh and I'll show you why that is. So the first one is Twitter. Twitter is pervasive these days, and you can use it as a stand-in for most other social networks. Um, you, you might argue that on that slide you saw before that MySpace and LinkedIn are older than podcasting. Yeah, well, so is my answer back to you on that. MySpace probably should have been better for podcasting, but they weren't, and, and LinkedIn's getting better, but it doesn't matter. Those, those, I want to talk more about Twitter than the rest of those. The reason I bring Twitter up here is because Twitter, if you were a podcaster for any length of time, those of you that had your hand up for the last like three years or older, Twitter was probably deeply influential to your podcast. It probably had a huge impact. When, well, I know when it came out, all of us jumped on board, and it suddenly was a new way for us to communicate. But Twitter is great as content producers. Stop thinking about being podcasters, thinking about being content producers. Mainstream media, these people, it's impossible to watch the news or watch a, a football game without seeing someone's Twitter handle on there, right? So Twitter is terribly disruptive to almost everything that we see these days. I talked about Apple as a company, and we all know that there's a new Apple phone coming out. Lord knows I need it because mine sucks. Um, but I don't think Apple is, is all that disruptive when it comes to the phone. I mean, they did that, obviously. The iPhone w w went huge and did a lot for smartphones, way better than BlackBerry did. But it's this is the stuff that interests me. We're talking about a wearable device, not these things. This is cool. No, actually, that's awesome, right? This is going to be the cool thing. Now, I don't know if that's really what the iWatch is going to look like. That's probably wishful thinking on my part and a lot of other technical geeks. But I can guarantee you, before I die, unless I get hit by a truck, we're going to see this. And Apple, whether you think they're innovative or not, is, and they're leading the charge in all these sorts of great stuff. 
Now you're saying, well, what about Google? Didn't they make a phone system? They did. I mean, the Android system was hugely important to things, but not necessarily just from a cell phone point of view. This little Android dude here up in space is more than a metaphor. Do you realize that right now there are a dozen satellites in low Earth orbit, orbit that are ran on the Android operating system? We have cell phones floating around in space, more or less. And, and by this time next year, there could be hundreds constantly launching up more and more CubeSats, all powered by Google and their open source Android operating system. It's amazing. YouTube is the killer market. There's really absolutely no doubt about that. YouTube has had a massive influence on all of our lives, even if you haven't watched um, Gundam Style, which I ha ha still have yet to watch. Nonetheless, terribly influential, the total killer app, and I will tell you this. From being a podcaster prior to YouTube, seeing YouTube come out here, I can tell you that YouTube kicked our asses. We ignored it, and it blew up. That's why, if you go ask anybody on the street today if they've heard of YouTube, you're going to get the answer, yes. And still, though, around 20% of the people have ever listened to a podcast. YouTube kicked the snot out of podcasting. Oh, I forgot to talk about Facebook. Um, yes, you will have to upgrade and get the Facebook Messenger app now. It will not work from Facebook anymore. Deal with it. That's life. Um, so all of these technologies are not only disruptive, I want to point out again, all of them are younger than this thing that we call podcasting. So what about podcasting? Think on this. I'll ask a question in a moment. The question in your head is right now, is podcasting disruptive? Well, let's find out. In order to understand, in order to answer that question, we have to understand what is disruptive. Is this a thing that exists? Is it something we can actually study? So short version is, yes, we can, and yes, I do. This is what I do now and have done for a little over the last year is understand what disruption is, what disruption is going to do, uh, and how we can harness the power of disruption and enable it. That's, that's exactly what I do when, as the CDO of Big Bounce, is I help companies that are disruptive figure out if their disruptive thing has any legs to continue or not. So it's a lot like podcasting in the, in, in the old days, but now I do it uh, mostly for businesses. So yes, it is something that we can definitely study, and I'm gonna help you identify some things about this study. However, if you're probably thinking your, med right, your head right now is podcasting, excuse me, disruption equals destruction. That is not true. So if you're thinking right now of disruptive as a bad, evil thing that puts people out of jobs and we shouldn't do it, no. Just because something is disruptive does not necessarily mean that it is destructive. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, how many people use Uber in the audience today? Awesome. I used Uber from the airport to get here, which is kick ass, I cannot take an Uber from Phoenix's airport because Phoenix sucks and suddenly Dallas is significantly better. So that's kind of cool, but I love Uber. Uber is my primary form of transportation. I take it almost everywhere that I need to go because we're a single car family and I ride my bike to work, so I don't even have a separate car. But Google, excuse me, Uber is disrupting not just taxis, but the concept of car ownership. For people like me, do I actually need another car? With a cool service like Uber, I don't have to do that. But here's why it's not destructive. About half of the time when I get into an Uber, it's driven by someone who used to drive a cab. This guy or gal, as one has happened, but they typically are guy cab drivers. Why are there no women cab drivers? Because they stink. Um, with the exception, um, not, I, don't, I don't mean women stink, I mean the cabs stink. Come on, come on, I want to make sure nobody understands that. Yeah, cabs smell, women wouldn't get in them. Wow. I'm gonna redeem myself in just a moment, I promise you on that. Holy shit, what a faux pas. Wow. Let's talk about masturbation. <laughs> and, and suddenly they're back, awesome, okay. <laughs> so these ex-cab drivers are now Uber drivers and they're loving life, they're making more money, they're in a cab that doesn't smell, really is what I was talking about. They, they didn't, they're not out of a job, They've got a better job now because of this power of something that's called Uber that all of us actually enjoy every day. But sometimes disruption is destructive, I'll be honest. It's not always a pretty rosy thing, but sometimes that's, that's an okay thing too. 
Destruction doesn't necessarily mean bad. I'll give you a great example of that. This is the CEO of a little company called Aetna. They've been around for 167 years, is how long Aetna has been in business. And this guy, their CEO, is investing ridiculous sums of money, launching a dozen or more independent companies, still owned by him. But these companies are, each one of them has one business goal. Put the larger parent company out of business. He's got a dozen or so companies aimed at trying to specifically kill his 167-year-old company. That may sound crazy, but it's not, because on a long enough time scale, no companies survive. If you don't believe me, I offer you Rome. It's going to happen. So this guy says, change is inevitable. I might as well be in charge of it myself. And to which I say, yeah, smart, smart play. OK. So I've been teasing you. I've been talking about disruption. I've been talking about a lot of things. So you probably want me to actually define the damn thing. All right, fine. So I'm going to define it. And I'm going to define it in my terms. So if you've been furiously taking notes ahead of time, nothing that I've said thus far is important. Um, but if you are determined to take notes, these are the only three notes you want to take. If you're not taking notes, stop. I don't really care. This is on my website at Big Bounce. You can get it. But if you're a note taker, pay attention. Because here's where the rubber meets the RSS feed. OK, number one, in order to be disruptive, a business is the way I think about business, or a product or a service, whatever you want to think about it, it must be aimed at an extant, stable marketplace. Extant is a fancy way of saying existing without as many letters. Um, that's it. Number one, it has to be going against some extant, stable marketplace. There is no point in trying to disrupt the space elevator market yet, because we don't have one. Second tenet of disruption, it services the underserved minority. The underserved minority is the key portion of this. Because forget, just for a moment, everyone, and think about who's being served in that marketplace not as well as they could be. Who is out there with a squeaky wheel who's saying, I'm not getting everything I want out of the big guys. I need something different. Your goal here is to cater to the unmet needs of a very, very small number of people before you try and scale up and reach and potentially make everybody happy or make your customers figure out what they want first. And then number through, number, number through? <laughs> number three, the ability to scale. And you can scale vertically, which means probably stealing people from your competition convincing the majority that they need to come over and join your way of doing things. Or you can scale horizontally, which is bringing in people who have no idea that that marketplace actually exists because you're doing something cool. And I'm going to give you some examples of companies that actually do this to help with the understanding. So the first one is the company We. We is often one of the classic examples of a disruptor uh, in the marketplace, and I'll explain to it why. When We was unleashed on the market in 2006, also younger than podcasting. When we were released in 2006, there were two dominant players in the marketplace, and they still exist today, Xbox and PlayStation. And for both Xbox and PlayStation, the way they outdid each other, the one-upmanship game they were playing was a bigger, fatter processor. Your games will run faster if you play them on Xbox or PlayStation, and they would just go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. We hits the marketplace with a processor that could not compete. It was super, super underpowered. Looked at raw processing power, the Wii was tiny. And so by and large, gamers and gamer magazines all panned it. This is not going to work. Half-Life 2 is going to suck on this game. Well, here's the deal. Half-Life 2 wasn't released on this platform. This was designed for somebody when they wanted to be in a boxing match as opposed to do this. People wanted to do this. When they wanted to play in a bowling game, they weren't doing this. They wanted to do this. So that's what they did. This motion control took a lot less power because they didn't worry about fancy graphics and all that. I mean, if you, we have bobblehead people that do this kind of weird stuff. So that's how they jumped in the marketplace. Um, and success, well, in 2012, more Wiis were sold than Xbox and PlayStation combined. Talk about scaling. Did a great job. Netflix. Any Netflix watchers in the audience? Of course. 
Got to love Netflix. Netflix, what I love about them, they're also held up as a classic disruptor, but they did it on a couple different ways. They disrupted their industry not once, not twice, but three different times. First one is by putting Blockbuster basically out of business by saying, hey, I can send you DVDs in the mail and you'll like it better because you don't have to return them in three days and get a $100 late fee. So basically put Blockbuster, one, one of the death knolls of, of, of Blockbuster, definitely. Um, the second thing they did was suddenly they're doing, they pivoted their model and now they offer streaming. And when they first offered streaming, about eight people wanted it. Talk about an underserved marketplace. No one had a stable enough connection, but there were enough people that were torrenting movies and other stuff. They said, we can make this better. So they pivoted and become streaming, and now streaming is where they make a giant pull of their cash, obviously. And the third uh, pivot that they made just recently was moving into independent production of content to the point now to where the broadcast networks are wondering, is appointment-based TV on its way out? Gods, I hope so. So majorly disruptive in a lot of different ways. I already talked about Uber, but there's, there's a couple of other aspects I want to bring up about them, not just because of their disruption on, on taxis and, and the ownership issue. Um, right now, these guys are in the process of how, how much horizontal scale can we actually do. They're branching out into brand new services, like real ride sharing where you, like when we leave here tomorrow to go to our hotel, you know, you jump in a cab and try and share that back and forth. Well, Uber's smart enough now to pick you up and pick somebody else along the way and somebody else along the way and wind up taking you to the airport and truly sharing a ride, which will be kind of cool. That's something that's new. They're also getting into delivery of products and services. So if you need a shovel from Home Depot to rent, Uber will pick it up for you and bring it. Kind of cool. And they need to do that because they're under tremendous pressure from a lot of government organizations that are trying to kick them out of the taxi cab business. So like any smart business person, they're trying to diversify their platform. My all time favorite example of disruption is SpaceX. Um, not just because I really want to go to space and have since I can remember, that would be awesome, but because these guys took on the military industrial complex. That's the market they decided to go after. We want to go after Lockheed Martin. We want to go after the people that are making rockets and putting them in space and we think we can make we can get an asset actually to supply this. An awesome, audacious move. Thanks to all of us donating to people on PayPal is pretty much what I'm sure drove all that. I mean, that's where all the money came from to do this one. These guys are pretty amazing. The thing about SpaceX is this. People don't quite get it. Oh, they're basically shuttling things into orbit. Here's what you don't understand, or you might not understand. Every time SpaceX launches, it's one-fifteenth of the cost to launch the space shuttle. One-fifteenth. And when Elon does it properly, he's already done it once, sort of, um, we'll see some more of these. His goal is to, if you haven't been watching, to reuse every component where they actually blast up into space, come back down and land on the exact same pad they all launched from. When that happens, it will get down to the one pound. To send one pound into orbit will cost $1,000. Today, it's between 15 and 20. Thousand. We're talking about another tenfold reduction in cost. So I could actually go to space for about, well, according to scales, about $192,000. I can actually launch myself into orbit, which is better than what Russia would charge me right now. They charge several million dollars to get me up there. I'm not sure I would trust them about it either. But you do not have to talk about these giant global companies to think about what is actually disruptive. Let's take this company, Thread the Flip, for an example. They are disrupting the resale industry. Newsflash, there's a resale industry. <clears throat> um, didn't know they existed, but they do. Thread, thread flip will send you an envelope in the mail. You shove your gently used women's quality fashion, I don't want your Kmart stuff, uh, back in the mail, and they will list it online in their entire network and do all of the work for it and sell it and give you all of the money. So if you're a woman and you don't know about thread flip, Sheila, raise your hand. Go talk to her. She will give you uh, a, a discount code because I get money when she does that. So, yes, thread flip, awesome, totally disrupting the market by, by doing some interesting, cool thing with mail. Tuft & Needle is a mattress company. They're disrupting the mattress industry. And the reason they did this is because if you bought a mattress recently, you probably paid, if you bought a high quality one, two to $3,000. The guys that started this company did that and said, we think we can do a better job. And so they deconstructed the whole process, took out all the middlemen out of the office, and dropped it down by 1,500%. They wrote custom, this is crazy, software engineers started a mattress company because they built supply chain management software and handed it out for free to a handful of suppliers to run this process. So now instead of $3,000 for mattress, 200 bucks for a high-end quality mattress. Amazing, 
quite disruptive to the small industry of buying a mattress. And the last example I'll give you before I get back into podcasting is BioLite. Now, BioLite is a pretty interesting product here. They're disrupting both remote power as well as home safety with a camp stove. It's an amazing model, and you're probably wondering, if I told you this camp stove can charge your iPhone, you would say, what's so disruptive about that? It sounds like a novel, very cool thing. Well, here's what's disruptive. You're in Western civilization. For the large majority of the world in a developing nation, when they're cooking at home, they're not cooking on a nice stove that you're cooking on. They have a fire built inside of their hovel. And fire, when you burn wood or trash or whatever laying around there, most of that does not go up in flame. It goes up in smoke and other noxious chemicals. So they've developed a stove that will make combustion much more complete, reducing the amount of excess crap that's thrown out into the air. And all the excess heat goes into generating power. Why don't they just plug their cell phone into the wall, Evo? Well, because it's a developing nation. They don't have a power grid. And for many of them, that cell phone is their only connection to the outside world. So saving lives and disrupting rural power, amazing story from BioLite. And the cool thing is they'll let us buy the same tools, too. If we go camping and want to look all nifty and keep our cell phones, we can do that as well. But what about podcasting? Is podcasting a disruption? Well, let's find out. I was recently on PodMov, well, it was a month ago, I don't know, um, and Jared asked me if I thought that, if I thought podcasting was a movement. And I gave him a qualified yes at the time because here we're at the podcast movement convention. But I'm wondering if I gave him the right answer. Let me explain why. Let's go through some popular movements that we can all agree on and we'll ask ourselves a question whether or not they're a movement, whether or not they're disruptive. Homeschooling is clearly a movement. There's a huge support structure in place for that. They have a common goal. Resist the temptation to say whether or not it's good or bad. That's not a relevant question in this one. The question is, is it a movement? It is very clearly a movement. There's a lot of people that are trying this. I want to do something different. Is it disruptive? Does it meet those three tenets of disruption? Well, it's going after an established incumbent market that's 100 plus years old, education. They're going after an underserved minority. That's who's buying the products right now. There's lots of picks and shovel sellers out there. And it can scale to everyone. So clearly a movement, clearly disruptive. Agreed? Actually, disagreement. Yes, no disagreement there. All right. Feminism. This will be the redeeming slide when I made the bad they stink comment. Um, thank you. Feminism, again, clearly a movement. I don't care if you think it's a good or a bad one. That's not a good question anytime, but certainly not up in here. It is clearly a movement. There is a goal, a common goal. They may not all agree on the right way to get there, and if you follow the feminist movement, you know there's a lot of strife in it right now, but clearly a movement going towards a common goal. Is it disruptive? As a member of the old boy network, hell yes, it's disruptive. Now you may argue the point on the second tenet, you say, Evo, it said underserved minority. Women actually outnumber men slightly, and that's true. However, not all women are into the feminist movement, and there's a fair number of men that actually are. So, trust me when I say, they are still a minority. So they fit. Movement and disruptive, clearly. Excellent. So what we're figuring here, oh wait, we're not done with this yet. We have, we have a couple more examples real quickly. I'm gonna let you guys play Q&A with me on this one here. I'm asking you're gonna respond. Harley riding, is it a movement? Yes. No. <laughs> it's not a movement because there's no common goal getting out on your bike and riding. It's the same goal as any motorcycle owner would actually have. It's fun, it's a cool club, and yes, there are special accident attorneys and special bikers' rights groups, but they're not necessarily for Harley riders, that's for motorcycle owners everywhere, not just for Harley riders. Is it disruptive? Now I've got you all curious, now no one's answering. I'll give you the answer on this one, but I'm gonna make you do the next one. No, riding a Harley Davidson is not disruptive. What industry would it disrupt? driving a car? I mean, it's, there's no true industry it's disrupting. It clearly appeals to a minority and it's clearly scalable, but it's not a movement and it's not disruptive. Ebooks. Is it, are ebooks a movement? Yes or no? No. Sorry, 
Ebooks are not a movement because ebooks are just a natural evolution of the way it was going to. There was no, okay, there were some standard industry groups doing there, but there's not a real movement for us today. If you're publishing a book today and you're not an ebook, you're just behind. You're not, you're not part of a movement. That's the way things are done today. I've been in publishing for the last 12 years, and this is the way it was always going to go. Is it disruptive? Clearly disruptive. Clearly disruptive. Huge amount of disruption happening in there. The publishing industry is long-standing, very, very entrenched. There's a minority of people who wanted e-books, used to have e-book readers, but they were terribly expensive and there were crappy material on them. But it's scaling up now to everyone. Growing big time. So excellent, excellent. So what we've learned out of these four examples is that movements think about feminism, think about homeschooling, are clearly disruptive by definition, but not always in the reverse. So with that and those trick questions out of the way, what about podcasting? First question, is podcasting a movement? Oh, now you guys are afraid. I promise I don't bite. Who thinks podcasting is a movement? Who, who doesn't think podcasting is a movement? I don't either. Sorry, Gary. Um, Podcast movement's an awesome thing, don't get me wrong. But I'm not so sure that podcasting is clearly a movement. We don't necessarily have common goals. I mean, you guys all seem to share, well, I shouldn't say that. A, a significant percentage of you here are interested in monetization and other sorts of things. But there are plenty of podcasters who just do it for the heck of it, who are still just farting around, having a good time. There are very, very different models, and there's no real big group. Now, maybe if the FCC does something really, really stupid, then we'd have to band together and become a movement with a common cause. But we don't have that right now. So we can still say, never mind, um, <laughs> without, without having to worry about it too much. So question number two, is it disruptive? Who thinks it's disruptive? Who doesn't think it's disruptive? I don't think it's disruptive either. First question, what industry is it disrupting? You bet it is. So let's pull up the iTunes uh, number, the top 10 list, and find out, oh, wait, all of them are terrestrial radio stations. They're playing in our sandbox. It might have been disruptive. And in fact, I think it was disruptive. But they're all here. The top 10 shows that are out there, maybe with one exception, are all radio shows done by radio people. That's OK. Not a bad thing, I'm not saying it's not. And it's clearly got a minority because we're only 20% level. And there's clearly lots of things we can scale. But it's not terribly disruptive. Maybe it was, maybe it's not. So I'll let you soak this in for a minute. Because I know some of you are terribly offended that I would dare to call it not a movement and not calling it disruptive, but I'm sorry, it's not. Um, but here's the deal about that, uh, so what? No, I don't think podcasting is a movement. I'm going to go a little bit worse than that, say not only is podcasting not disruptive. Um, I don't think, here we go. I don't think a podcast can be disruptive. I don't think a podcast network can be disruptive. No one threw anything at me. That's kind of awesome. Um, however, I do think, feel, and know that podcasting, the verb, the thing that we are doing on a regular basis, the technology play in hand, has great potential for being disruptive. And that is the message I'm trying to convey. You are at the, some of you are at the long tail. You've been here for a long time. Some of you are at the very beginning of this one. We have barely scratched the surface on what it means to be disruptive in the podcasting movement. Let me give you an example of something I brought up earlier, patiobooks.com. This site we put online in 2005, as I mentioned previously. We do, again, podcasted audiobooks. They're free to listen to. If you're an author, they're free to put up. We make money in weird ways. Don't worry about monetization. We never started worrying about that one. When we began podcast or patio books back in 2005, it was because it was starting to happen. There were already three or four guys that were putting their books out as podcasts. And I said, well, let's roll them together. And let's create this thing called patiobooks.com to, to somehow just kind of channel it. We really didn't know what the hell we were doing. We, we saw an idea. And we said, oh, let's see if this actually can work for us or now. So no much of a plan. We decided to become disruptive and didn't know it. Well, now we were going against the good industry, audiobooks. $871 million in 2005 were spent on audiobooks. 
Today it's over a billion dollars. So we definitely have an established industry. What about the minority or the underserved marketplace out there? Well, that was actually a two-sided marketplace, which is fancy business speak for suppliers and consumers. Both of them could actually use the site, and there was an underserved minority there. Um, the access to creating audiobooks in 2005, if you were not an already published author that had already decided to make an audiobook out of your book, you basically had zero choices. There was no other way for you to get your book out there. And likewise, if you were a consumer of audiobooks, you were limited to only the audiobooks that the publishing industry, the big six, which is now the big five, actually would allow you to do. That, and they all came on a dozen CDs and cost you $65, and so that was cost prohibitive in and of itself. So we had a definite opportunity to scale both of those audiences. Since only a tiny fraction of published books were available as an audiobook, suddenly this new thing called podcasting that put microphones in front of everyone's faces, it's the same technology you guys use to record your show, right? They can do this as an audiobook as well. And right, there were so few readers on, on this because uh, the, the, you had to buy a 12 CD set, it didn't, or listeners I should say, to buy a 12 CD set, it didn't make a lot of sense. So we had a lot of room to scale that one uh, as, as well. So was, were we successful? Well, probably. By definition, we were, we were definitely in the, in the disruptive marketplace. Um, we did some disruption to the audiobook industry with podcasting, but here comes the cautionary tale of, of the show. We started this in 2005, um, and the markets moved big time since 2005, right? Um, Independent audio producers now are able to produce content on their own. They couldn't before. In fact, Audible, the primary supplier of audio content, now has a service called ACX, which stands for Audiobooks Creators Exchange, that puts writers and producers and narrators together in a network and say, hey, let's produce a whole bunch of stuff. So a closed garden suddenly gets opened up to a whole lot of people. That changed big time for us. Um, Underserved listeners now have lots of options. Thanks to that, that changed our marketplace. And also, ebooks hit the marketplace. When we started this, there were no Kindles. There was no KDP marketplace. So we were the only outlet for a lot of underpublished authors who wanted to reach an audience through the technology of podcasting. Suddenly, when you can make an ebook with two clicks of a mouse, you don't have to go through the pain and suffering of taking your 80,000 word novel and converting it into an audiobook, which I'd have to tell you guys is not easy. So those things changed on us. Still, we're doing okay. We're fine. We've got 678 titles, as I said. We're pushing out 1.5 million downloads, so I'm not crying over spilled milk. We just didn't move very quickly. We didn't move very quickly, and I think it, it left us, so we left some opportunities on the table that we didn't really know about. So I'm leaving you guys with this. I'm challenging you to think about that idea of using the technology of podcasting to figure out what is disruptive. I'm not saying go home and stop producing your show. I'm not saying immediately kill your network. None of that's smart. I did all that stuff while I was doing patiobooks.com. Because a lot of you don't care about being disruptive. You just want to make your show, you make a little money and do that, and that's great, that's awesome. But the future of this is going to come from doing things that are unexpected today, and people like you in the audience are going to be the ones that are doing that. If you want to be disruptive, figure out what industry you want to go up against. Get to know the real underserved minority, like we did with audiobook listeners. And then test and refine your model to figure out what exactly is working, and find a way to make it scale. And then tell me about it, because I love stories like this. I study disruption. This is exactly what I get into, and I want to do more. And plus, 10 years ago, this stuff started out with two dorks and a microphone. And surely, and remember, I was a guy that did two dorks and a microphone really, really freaking well. But there's got to be a better way to do it. There's got to be more interesting things to do. And I think you guys are the right position and the right place to get that done. Thank you very much for listening to me. My name is Evo Terra. Let's go get some beer. <laughs> do I have any time at all left for questions? Is there any time left? How's my time? I have one minute or four minutes? Four minutes. So I, have, I do have time for questions if anybody has a question. And if your question is, can I buy you a beer later? Yes. Um, if your question is, will you be on my podcast? Yes. I love being a guest on podcasts. Um, uh, anything else is fair game. Lynette?
oh, wait a minute, do I have a microphone runner? Yeah, yeah, wait a minute, here's my problem. Please use a microphone because I'm also deaf as a post, and I will not be able to hear you. Yeah, so. me too, brother. Awesome. Um, so here's the thing, in hindsight, had Patio Books been like your primary revenue generator, what do you think you would have done differently then to stay more competitive? knowing what the landscape is now? Um, I would have made it my primary revenue generator. I mean, that would have, I would have given it the attention necessary to do that. I would have found interesting ways to, to monetize, to do more stuff, because really the site hasn't changed all that much since then. I would have found new, interesting, novel ways. I've been chatting with some people today that's already given me great ideas of what I would have done differently, ways I could have helped people and been assistant. I, I was very hands-off. It's all up to you to record the audio. And if you can't do it, tough luck, Buttercup. I'm moving on to somebody else. I'm a little bit of a jerk. So that wasn't necessarily the right thing. I, I would have been a nicer person. There, there's the succinct answer to your question, Lynette. All the way in the back. Hey, Evil. Hey, everybody. My name is John Dennis. My website is www. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you were killing me. <laughs> um, great presentation, by the Thank way. You. Thank you. Uh, my question is, you, you, I guess, you, you say podcasting isn't disruptive. Right. But what would you call Stitcher Radio? Yeah, so technology plays, right? I think Stitcher, um, I think SoundCloud, hell, I even think Libsyn from back in the day. I mean, Libsyn, by the way, I got to shout out Libsyn. If, if there was no Libsyn, there would be no patiobooks.com. So thank you, Rob, uh, for keeping that going. But Stitcher and these other technology plays, these guys are perfect. Because you know what industry they're disrupting? Podcasting which is interesting, right? Because they're bringing in a new play for how things actually get done. I would say they would, they're supporting podcasting, wouldn't you? I don't know that I make much of a distinction between those two things to be totally honest. They're disrupting the status quo in podcasting. They came out with, a, with a, a different model. And I'm just using Stitcher as a proxy for all the new technology plays that are coming along. Um, yes, they are totally supportive and they're disruptive. Remember when I said you don't have to be uh, destructive to be disruptive, they're a non at least for us, non-destructive, disruptive. By the way, that's really hard to say. All of you right now, <laughs> disruptive, destructive three times and you won't be able to get it right. Um, yeah, so I think it's totally that way. Yep. Hi, Evo. Uh, thank you for bringing the message. It must have been tough for you to say this to, to everybody here today. <laughs> nah, I like pissing people off. It's okay, good. okay. <laughs> um, I do the sci-fi movie podcast. Excellent. Do you want to be on our show? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. What are you doing right now? Let's do it right now. Okay. <laughs> now, the question I want to ask you is, I come from radio, and I, I yeah. thought for the longest time, podcasting is going to take down radio. Yep. But radio is amazingly resilient because <laughs> of drive time in cars. Yep. As long as cars are still in existence, I think radio is still going to be in existence. Yeah. Is there ever going to be a time when podcasting overtakes conventional terrestrial radio? <sighs> mm. Let's see. I'm going to try and not answer with a yes or no question. So podcasting has some problems in its way. One of them is in the 10 years I've been doing this, the, the level of effort when we first started to subscribe to a podcast was right here. 10 years later, right here. It hasn't changed. Absolutely no change. So we've got to change it up from that one. I, um, but what I think is I think that content producers, which is what all of you are, I think you're more a content producer than you're a podcaster. As I said, podcasting is a verb, right? We talk about texting, no one calls themselves a texter. <laughs> Just what we do. I don't think you guys should call yourself podcasters, sorry. But I think you're content producers, and I think there are new ways of getting things um, onto, specifically drive time, right? I mean, obviously, XM Satellite uh, did a big thing. Um, there is a new product, and why am I blanking on the name of it? It's brought out by Harman Audio, AHA, A-H-A. Exclamation point. And they were doing streaming. They had some deals with some of the major car makers for the 2014, 2015 models to stream content down digitally to them in a much nicer interface. So you would do that as opposed to turning on the AM FM dial. And I think there's some interesting opportunities we could do that, but it takes a lot of collusion to get there. And, pon and content creators, I almost said podcasters, content creators can play in those sandboxes. So get your shows out any way you possibly can. Don't worry about just RSS feeds distributing audio and video files. Anything else? Right up front here. Shout. Wait a minute. Hang on a minute. He can come up there. Donald the cowboy. Donald the Jamaican cowboy will come and give you that. So, so Dan Go, okay, go. Daniel here. <laughs> uh, Daniel here visiting from uh, Guatemala. So you're claiming that the podcast industry is not a disruptor. What would you say about the third world? Is there any chance that uh, it could be a disruptor of the traditional radio as we know in the third world? 
Yes, it certainly could be. Um, the, do you not have the same barrier problem that I subtly talked about, the, how hard it is to subscribe to a podcast? I mean, to me, I think it's content, quality of content being pushed out there. I don't know enough about the third world to, the developing nations, I like to say, because first, second, third, where's the fourth world? Mars. Mars is the fourth world. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I honestly can't answer the question, but I, but I know that if you're producing content for the right kind of niche audiences, they'll find a way to get there, and there's probably a huge, for scale, developing nations are, are gigantic, so think about a way to get your content put out to them as well. You have to tell me what's happening in Guatemala. I, I don't know. I don't know. Zero time is what she said. Should have Thanks, everybody. Beer's on you. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>